You've seen his face before, probably during a particularly distressing bout of sleep paralysis. His appearance can vary a bit from manifestation to manifestation, but a few traits are always present. He resembles an elderly man, his touch corrodes everything in his path, his presence creates a disgusting, black, mucus-like substance thought to be a method of pre-digestion of his prey, and he is rotting. No matter his appearance, he is always in some stage of decomposition, gray skin sloughing away from yellowed bone, eyes milky and flat but brimming with malice, wide, toothless mouth stretched into a wicked grin. The entity is incredibly difficult to contain, its corrosive properties and ability to vanish into solid matter and disappear into its pocket dimension layer make it a threat as unpredictable as it is dangerous. The smell of decay and the presence of visible corrosion on any surfaces nearby may be the only warning a person gets before the old man grabs them in his decomposing arms, dragging them off to a painful, terrifying demise. We know where the being disappears to and have learned a great deal about how he operates, but where did he come from? It is the year 2000. Dr. Robert Scranton and his wife, Dr. Anna Lang, are the head researchers at SCP Foundation Site 120. Over the course of their happy relationship, the two have been working on an experimental research project, an early prototype reality anchor device called the Lang Scranton Stabilizer. After a lot of late nights at the office, working and reworking the theory, it is, at long last, ready for testing. Dr. Scranton is standing in Reality Lab A, as Dr. Lang observes from a nearby room. He follows the same routine he has followed each time they tested the LSS, walking down a line of buttons and levers, pressing and flipping each into place. The little red blinking light signifies that the microphone is recording his every comment and observation. Suddenly, the routine is broken by a low rumbling sound from deep, deep within the earth. The ground beneath him begins to shake, and Dr. Scranton stumbles, losing his balance as the once solid floor begins to roil and quake as the seismic shift rolls through the site. He hears the unmistakable grind and splintering of metal and plastic as the LSS-2 begins to shake, components sliding out of place and breaking off. Nearby, Dr. Lang's monitor goes dark as the security feed is cut short by the earthquake's damage. Robert! She screams, making a break for the door and rushing to Reality Lab A, terrified that she will find her husband's body lying on the floor. When she and the guards reach the room, however, they find… nothing. Well, not nothing entirely. The room is a wreck, bits of machinery strewn across the floor, the smell of burning plastic in the air. But the Lang Scranton Scrambler's control panel and Dr. Robert Scranton are nowhere to be found. Dr. Lang falls to her knees in the suddenly empty room, pounding at the floor in despair. Where did he go? She demands, but of course, no one knows the answer. No one wants to say what they're thinking. Wherever he is, Dr. Scranton is probably dead. Probably long, long gone and he is never coming back. But no one says it, not out loud. They just think it, and keep thinking it, for the next five years, eleven months, and twenty-one days. The time passes, and most everyone forgets about Dr. Robert Scranton. Everyone except for Dr. Anna Lang. She never gives up hope, never lets go of the possibility that somewhere, in another world, another time, on another planet, her love is still alive. One day she wakes up and it's December 23, 2005, a day like any other, save for its uncomfortable proximity to the holidays she struggles to celebrate nowadays. But then, in the middle of the day, something impossible happens. The LSS control panel reappears in Reality Lab A. It isn't how anyone last saw it, though. It's coated in some sort of unidentified organic matter and it reeks of blood, vomit, and decay. As her colleagues try to shield her from the sight, try to warn her away, Dr. Anna Lang wades into the area, desperate for a glimpse at any sign of her husband's fate. As she makes her way into the containment field, she is unable to contain her horror. Oh God, what the hell, what, what, what is all this? This, this is, this is the, oh God, Robert, Robert, is this you? Oh God, please, please, no, don't let it be you, don't let it be you. Robert, I thought, I thought, how can this thing be? Her colleagues try to stop her, but she touches the Lang Scranton stabilizer interface and it fires to life. It still works. Somehow it still works. She racks her brain for what to do next before saying, Access audio log, playback starting from January 2nd, 2000. The machine prompts her to verbally state her password and her voice shakes as she replies, Password is Anna Bobana. Request acknowledged. Processing. The machine replies, I'm sorry. 
There are no audio logs for January 2nd, 2000. Dr. Scranton accessed log on January 13th, 2000 via voice recognition at time. Anna slams her hands down on the machine with a cry. Play back now, damn it, play it back! The researcher warns her not to touch any of the material with her bare hands, but she doesn't hear him. She is too busy, calling out to Robert, hoping that somehow, somewhere, he can hear her. There's so much blood here, there's so much... Honey, are you okay? Where did you go? Oh god, oh god, oh god. Something small and metallic clatters to the floor, lost in the sludge. She retrieves it, wipes it off on her lab coat, and holds it to the light. She would recognize it anywhere. She slipped it onto her true love's finger on the happiest day of her life. It's Robert's wedding ring. Her knees buckle at the realization. She collapses to the ground, and her head cracks against the floor. One of her colleagues snaps into action. Report, this is Dr. Matthew Skinner reporting from Site 120 Reality Lab A. I need medical attention here immediately. Once Dr. Lang recovers from her fall, she demands access to the rematerialized control panel. She's going to go through the audio logs one by one and find out exactly what happened to her husband, even if the truth is as ugly as she fears. The machine whirs to life, and her lost love's voice emanates from the speakers. Name, Robert Scranton, age 39. Birthday, September 19th, 1961. Favorite color, blue. Favorite song, living on a prayer. Wife, Anna. She has green eyes. I love her very much. He repeated these simple truths to himself for days, before he even realized that the control panel was picking up his voice. My name is Robert Scranton. Yeah, yeah, my name is Robert Scranton, former researcher at Foundation Site 120. It has been... I don't know, actually. I, I can't remember. I, I estimate it's been ten days, but I, I, I don't... I, I can't... Oh, God. Can anyone hear me? I, I, I don't know what's happened. I, I don't know where I am, and... And please, please, is anyone there? Hello? Anyone? Anyone? He began keeping track of how much time passed as best he could. Two weeks, three days, seven hours, and 58 minutes. Oh, Jesus. Back at the Foundation, with at least a tenuous knowledge of where Dr. Scranton could be, Personnel try their best to stage some kind of rescue effort. A mobile task force team is ordered to attempt to replicate the experiment with a hastily assembled Lang Scranton stabilizer copy. The result is an explosion that kills three of them. Senior researchers also approach SCP-343, a powerful reality warper known to some as God, hoping to get some insight from him about where Dr. Scranton could be found. His response is, He's beyond any of us now. I'm truly, dreadfully sorry. Anna starts having nightmares. She twists and turns in bed, haunted by visions of her beloved Robert consumed by darkness. A strange specter starts to appear in her dreams, a man with a horrible, rotted face. She turns to her bedside table in the night, numbers blurry on the screen of her alarm clock. The photograph of herself and Robert that she keeps there. Something is wrong with him, wrong with his face. Is it that same awful, rotted man? She screams and closes her eyes when she opens them photo is normal again. She weeps into her pillow. It can't keep going on like this. This place, it's, it's some sort of reality gap, I think. If I don't concentrate on it, it's fine, but I feel this tingling all over my face. I'm not sure why. Two months, 15 days, four hours. Anna begins to accept the horrible truth. She may not see Robert ever again, and holding on to the foolish fantasy that she will is starting to kill her. She repeats it to herself like a mantra at work. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. Robert Scranton is dead. One day, a co-worker notices her muttering and strikes up a conversation. It's been years since Robert disappeared. What's the harm in talking to someone again? She even finds herself smiling and laughing at his jokes. But when he asks if she'd like to go for coffee, she gets a flash of Robert screaming in the darkness, of that terrible, rotted face grinning. She runs to the bathroom to throw up and weep. The tingling in my face has worsened. I wish I could sleep here, but all this damn gunfire overhead. I can't take it anymore. I can't take it. 
trench foot, shell shot. Hell would be reprieve in a place like this. And all the men, all the poor souls who look up to me, call me Corporal. What a jerk. To think I have any more idea of what's going on here. And I can hear it in his voice. He's getting worn down. As Anna feels her emotions start to dull and fade, she begins accepting more dangerous assignments from her superiors, perhaps hoping just to feel something again. She works on the SCP-682 case, trying to devise more futile termination methods. She spends time with SCP-939, the abominations known as With Many Voices, until they start to imitate Robert's voice, and she knows that she can't do this anymore. She works with SCP-280, Eyes in the Dark, feeling no fear whatsoever as it floats towards her. The worst thing that could possibly happen to her has happened already. Now, she's just waiting, killing time. She has no idea of the further horrors to come. Lately, I've been hearing whispers in the dark. I think the rats are talking to me. <laughs> Funny. My troops must think me mad. What does it matter? This is a mad place, a mad time. A mad man is perhaps best suited to a time like this. So many went over the top yesterday, only to be cut down by machine gun fire. Isn't it odd that I laughed? It was so funny. I think perhaps this mental malady is connected to a physical one. Nosebleeds and vomiting spells. A strange black liquid. Faintly acidic to the touch. But so... <sighs> delicious. So fun. My troops tell me I look unwell. Like anything about this is well. Maybe I'll sneak into one of their bedsits tonight and teach them to lighten up a bit. None of them smile anymore. Me. I'm always smiling. I'll teach those little cowards to smile too. But as she listens to more of the logs, she's forced to reckon with the fact it really isn't him anymore. Not as she'd ever known him. He'd become something else. All the others are dead. <laughs> All my good, hard work. Making them dead. I followed them down the length of the trench. Their silly little bullets didn't hurt me. Oh no. Oh no, no, no. The look on their faces. All the screaming as they saw me. How thrilling to savor their fear as I approached. All those screams. What are you, you horrible old man? I showed them what I am. I can walk through walls now, you know. Have all the fun I want. Yes, yes, yes. Nothing can hurt me anymore, and I can hurt everyone. And when the war is over, I'll go home. Go home to my sweetheart. I know she's waiting for me. I can't wait to see her, to touch her beautiful face. My lovely, lovely Anna. Hearing him like this, so broken, so utterly transformed, it's too much for her to bear. But the work always needs her, and she returns to it day after day. One night, she sits up late, making her way through a stack of paperwork. When she hears it, a curious sound. Drip, drip, drip. Something thick dripping steadily onto the floor behind her. The smell of rot fills her nostrils, making her gag. She turns and comes face to face with SCP-106, dripping its slimy black mucus onto the floor, bringing decay to everything it touches. It reaches out toward her, grasping at her arm. She breaks free, but not before its touch melts away the fibers of her lab coat, threatening to seep through the fabric to her skin. All the while, it's staring straight at her, like it knows her. Anna runs out of the lab as fast as she can, shouting for help. A guard tries to come to her assistance, firing his weapon at the old man but the bullets don't leave a dent, don't even slow him down. The old man grabs the weapon from the guard's hands, letting the metal rust, warp, and melt in his grasp. Then he turns his corrosive touch on the guard's face. Anna screams in horror at the sight, 
but she can do nothing to help him. All that she can do is keep running and hope that the monster doesn't catch her. She runs as fast as her legs can carry her, but she isn't as young as she once was, and years of sitting at a desk have made her muscles stiff and weak. Her foot hits the ground at just the wrong angle, and she stumbles, falling to the ground. She scrambles back to her feet, but when she looks up, something is horribly wrong. Her surroundings have changed. It looks like the foundation site, but it's not quite the same. It's as if someone tried to recreate the facility from memory and couldn't retain all of the details. Then she hears it again. The drip, drip, drip. He's here. She spins around, and there it is. That awful face, so close to her own. She takes a trembling step back, when suddenly, the monster speaks. <laughs> it's him. She knows it, as surely as she knows that she is about to die. The monster that once was Robert Scranton reaches out and caresses Anna's cheek with his wrinkled hand. She screams as the skin begins to droop, and he seals her lips with a kiss that makes her insides drip like melting wax. The two become one once again. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-096, Sad Origin Story, 